Morning. Valencia. The world of Kenshi is full of evil, corrupt and narcissistic royals, racist and misogynistic zealots, flesh-hungry skeletons, and many other vile factions. But what if I put a stop to it? What if I could overthrow those leaders and replace them with the good, the honorable, and the heroic? I'll be playing Kenshi with no mods, pure vanilla, and I'll pick the rock bottom scenario. Will I save the world in 100 days? Or is there no saving anyone or anything? Our hero is Zero. Now I know what you're thinking. Zero? Is it because he's nothing right now? And you'd be half right. Zero, when you think of it, is powerful. You can't divide it no matter how you slice it. You can't divide a nothing cake. Furthermore, you can't perceive it because when you think of it, you can't perceive nothing. Perceiving nothing would mean there's something there to perceive. Also, he's a cool character from Borderlands. <laughs> So our hero is gonna be unstoppable. For race, I went with human, and for subrace, I went with Scorchlander for that juicy 20% XP bonus in athletics. Day 1. Zero is hungry and missing his left arm while stranded in the great desert. He's weak and frail and couldn't defend himself. So I need food, equipment, and cats to fund my training. No, not actual cats. It's just the name of the in-game currency. Though it's cute to think of traders just exchanging for product. My first order of business was getting to the nearest city for some food. I didn't have any cats, so I did as you would do for the beginning of any run. I mined ore. I still had one functional arm, so I might as well put it to good use. While I was mining, I found a pile of Garu corpses. The inner loot goblin in me was happy to oblige in these gifts. They had meat and leather that I could sell. I used the cats to buy a backpack. Then I decided to make a run for the United City's capital of Heft. On my travel, I came across a Hiver caravan. I knew these guys sold cheap prosthetics, so I had a little browse of their wares. And I was right. Now I had a functional but shoddy quality left arm. Then I continued my sprint to Heft, evading any perils in my way. In Heft, I exchanged my small backpack for a trader's backpack. It was an investment for an idea I had. I just needed more funds to start it, so I would need to find some stuff to sell. I thought about doing activities here, but the deserts were too dangerous. Slavers, skimmers, bandits, and noble kill squads. Staying here while Zero was still level 1 in his skills would be a death sentence. First, I went over to Stoat. This would be my last stop before I would just start my long journey. I wasn't looking for anything specific there. I did stop by the bar to purchase some food for the road though. Then they chose to leave the dangerous desert for Holy Nation territory. They're harmless if you're human and don't have any prosthetics on. Hence why I unequipped my economy arm before embarking. During my sprint, I got bit by a bone dog while traversing the Spine Canyon. Luckily, I had a bandage to patch myself when I was safe. What a cheap shot, SMH. When I arrived in Okrin's Pride, a high paladin approached Zero. I was very tempted to just attack the religious radical, but a cooler mind prevailed. I'd get my pound of flesh and due time. For now, I just had to go along with the charade and he gave me medical supplies. The idiot believed the ruse. I arrived at Blister Hill, the holy nation capital. I stopped here to mine some iron ore and sold it. I didn't buy anything at the bar, but I did steal some bread, leather, and a small figure. Then I trained my lock picking when no one was looking. Finally, I left for the southern part of Okrin's Gulf. There was a city there I could resupply at. At the boot store, I bought some sandals so I could run even faster. Reduce the travel time, you know? Anyways, the reason why I ran all the way down to Stat was to train my athletics so I could run faster. Why? Because I thought it would be an appropriate time to gather team members. I just need to run to Mongrel and hopefully not get captured then eaten by Fogmen. In the Fog Islands, I was nimble enough to escape any Fogmen patrols and made into Mongrel unscathed. I was here for the almighty beep. A bit of a mean character among the Kenshi community, but his Hiver racial bonuses were good for stealthy stuff. I bought him a backpack and sandals, but then I realized Hivers can't wear footwear, so I saved them for later. The both of us made our exit. We were making our way to Squin for our next squad mate, Ruka. She's a Shek, so she's great for strength, heavy weapons, and other combat related skills due to their racial bonuses. Anyways, now that I had a squad rounded up, it was time to mi- Oh, Hungry Bandits. I let 
the gate guards handled them, and then I looted the spoils of battle. What was I saying? Oh right, mining. I needed cats to start my profit project. Once I had the copper ore, I embarked for the swamp. There was a city over there that grew hemp and produced hashish, a recreational drug in Kenshi that is illegal in most cities. However, you can make profit selling the stuff. In Shark, the stuff is cheap, so I'm just going to buy in bulk. Then I'll head to Flats Lagoon to sell the stuff for a massive markup. This was going to be the plan for the next several days. I just need to dodge the roaming patrols of Red Sabers, Swamp Ninjas, Blood Spiders, Dust Bandits, Hungry Bandits, Beak Things, Gorilla Bandits, and Land Bats. Yeah, it was brutal and our group did get roughed up, but it was totally worth it for the profits. I even had Zero continue the operation while Ruka and Beep had to rest from their wounds. Eventually, I had too much product to sell. I had to buy stuff from the shop owners just to sell them more hashish. It was maps and a better arm for Zero. Not the best, but a skeleton arm, which is far better than a shoddy economy arm he previously had equipped. Also, when it was morning and more shops opened, I bought some armor for Zero, Ruka, and Beep, including a crossbow for Beep. I figured since he was the weakest in the group, he would benefit from training his ranged combat skills. As the squad left Flats Lagoon, we came across the aftermath of a fight. It seems a lone drone won against a Beep thing. I healed him up and wished him luck before we continued with our business. We were making that bread. Er, well, cats? Bread cat? Whatever. I just wanted the surplus of funds to buy better equipment and fund our quest. It was mostly peaceful travels. Until day 10 in which we got ambushed by a couple swamp ninjas. Zero and Ruka got KO'd within seconds. And Beeped only survived because he stunned them with his crossbow shots. I had to retreat him into the safety of Shark before I could rescue the rest of the team. During the downtime, I had Beep practice his lock picking skill as well. The next day I figured we could use some more members to bolster our strength. I went into the bar to pick up the former slave, Mew. She has the unique ability to detect when spiders are nearby. A literal spidey sense. And just in the nearby building, we picked up Hamut. He's an idealist like us. He wants to put an end to slavery, so he's definitely in. Both Mew and Hamut are Greenlanders, so they don't have the big racial bonuses like Ruka and Beep do, but they joined us for free. So all the better for us and our cats. We all set out to continue our hashish run. We were going to purchase from some nearby village since I bought out the shark supply already. That's when we came across more swamp ninjas. But this time the gate guards cut them down. We just helped ourselves to the spoils of battle. We even carried their bodies to train our strength. Even with our greater squad size, we had to resort to retreating most of the time there was an attack. At least for the big patrols. If we outnumbered our enemies, it gave us a fighting chance. When we arrived at Flats Lagoon on day 13, we sold our hash and made more than 100,000 cats. We used a surplus of cats to buy some equipment for our newer members and decided to find a new friend to help us carry our stuff. A Garu! We bought them from the settled nomads in Shem. Garus are pack animals, so it makes sense for our squad to have one. We would go into the border zone to scavenge some ruins for random assortments of loot. We did get attacked by some hungry bandits as we were traveling to a nearby way station. I thought we were strong enough to handle some weak bandits. Well, we did win, but at a heavy cost. Most of the squad was limping or had to be carried. After recuperating our wounds, we looted another ruins, then headed to the hub to sell our findings. We were in the area to train our dexterity and toughness with the weaker enemy patrols. That's when I realized I know a better way to train our members. To go forward with this idea, I would need to go to the Deadlands and visit the city there, Black Desert City. It's a skeleton city with hostile robot spires just roaming outside the city. Once I got my group under the safety of a roof from the acid rain, I also remembered there's someone here we can recruit. Sad Neil. He's a depresso expresso, but he's a skeleton, meaning he's more resilient to attacks. He doesn't have to eat food. And he's just like Beep. He's immune to acid rain. I do now have to be careful in certain regions, as some factions will just outright attack your group if you have a skeleton in your group. <clears throat> Holy nation. <clears throat> After Sad Neil joined up, I had them go out and find a robot spider. Once I found one, I'd lead them back into the city for the residents to knock out. Then I took the damaged spider into the skeleton repair bed and began training my weapons on its metal frame. I even found another spider just outside of the city that I also put to use. Each squad mate took turns to train on each bot. I even trained martial arts because it also trains toughness for everyone except Sad Neil. His hands are metal so it won't hurt as much to have metal on metal contact. On the other hand, flesh on metal hurts. While I was here, I purchased a specialist quality left arm for zero. To my knowledge, Black Desert City has the best prosthetics you can buy. Definitely worth the thousands of cats. By day 21, I was finished training my squad. They were all in the 50 to 
360 attack skill, a big improvement so I felt safer traveling into United City's territory to test it out. The grass pirates I encountered were tough. My team members were glass cannons. They could deal a good amount of damage, but when they got hit they suffered attack penalties. My party was about to be wiped, but ironically, a slaver caravan came in to save the day. <laughs> Beep could have handled it with his trusty crossbow. Anyways, we rested and we headed deeper into the great desert. Funnily enough, a group of slaves threatened us. We were trying to be of no harm. Nonetheless, they didn't believe us and we had to defend ourselves. Unfortunate. We did heal their wounds so they wouldn't instantly die out here. Then some blood raiders ambushed us and knocked everyone down. However, a passing nomad caravan helped take care of the remaining raiders. That gave us some breathing room to wake up our squad and heal our downed members. While that was happening, I had Ruka loot the dead raiders gear, one of which was still alive. I got caught stealing from him, which increased my thievery skill. So I just went along with it and had Ruka continually rob the raider. Ruka is not at all a stealth based character, so it's funny seeing her thievery skill climb up all the way up to 38 levels. We were battered, limping, and probably easy prey for highwaymen to mug us. During the travel, I realized I hadn't named our faction, so I gave us the faction name Zero's Heroes. We hauled ourselves into Henge. Unluckily, we got attacked by some rebel farmers. These guys were actually one of the factions we were trying to ally with, so I didn't want to attack them. I just had my squad split off from each other for a mad dash into the city. Anyone that didn't make it had to be carried into the city once the area was cleared. Speaking of allies, once everyone was in the safety of the city walls, I went to the shinobi tower to join the thieves. They're an easy faction to ally with since all you have to do is pay a 10,000 cat fee. Then you get full access to their tower, in which I immediately used to let our injured recuperate. Once healed, I went for stoke. During the trip, a manhunter tried to attack us. He was easily outnumbered so I went in for the kill. No one was going to be enslaved today. We were in stoke to sell anything we didn't need and supply before going into World's End, a city in the arm of Okran. I wanted to see if I could ally myself with the tech hunters. Now I know what you're thinking. Damn, what's with all the talk about allies? Well, I'm glad you asked. It's part of the plan. What's the plan, dumb? My dooders and dudettes, this plan is what I call Operation Kingslayer. It's gonna be a three-part plan. First, alliances. If we're going to take on the forces of evil, we're going to need friendlies to assist us. We have a list. In no particular order, it's the Tech Hunters, the Hounds, the Shek Kingdom, the Anti-Slavers, the Flotsam Ninjas, the Crab Raiders, and the Rebel Farmers. Not only will these factions help us fight, but after we dispose of the current tyrants, we will need someone to fill in the power vacuum. Otherwise, someone worse could take their place. And disposal is part two of the operation. We will have to assassinate each leader in this list I have created. We will have to take out each leader in this order, otherwise someone else may take their place and our work will be in vain. Finally, we have cleanup. Once we have taken out the major faction leaders, we will help the effort to take out the stragglers, the smaller hostile factions. On the grand scale of things, these factions are just small fry, but nothing wrong with going above and beyond to save this world. Understood? Alright, back to the challenge. In World's End, I went into the Science HQ. I talked with their leaders, but I could not figure out how to ally with them. I actually wasn't totally sure I could even ally them without using mods, so I put a pin in that. As we were in neutral standings with them, so better than being on bad terms. On my way out of World's End, I did encounter a lone paladin. Usually they roamed in military patrols, but a single one? He must be a survivor from a recent battle. Impressive. Now the reason why I was roaming in Holy Nation territory, I was looking for the hidden village of the Flotsam Ninjas. They're based out in the hidden forest. I did manage to find it, and I had a talk with their leader, Maul. They're a group of female ninjas. The Holy Nation doesn't treat women well, and sometimes group them with the races they consider inferior, so resentment caused this group to form. A great majority of them are still religious, so some residents will still gasp or shriek at the sight of skeletons. After forming the alliance with Maul, I thought it would be a great time to add an additional member to the group. I embarked for the nearby floodlands and searched for a certain tower. I found it. Burn's Tower. Burn is a skeleton, a seasoned adventurer too, and he was curious about our goals so he joined up to become one of the heroes. Plus, having another skeleton 
that wasn't sad all the time is better for morale. It also gave us access to his tower, free loot, and a free skeleton repair bed. We are 8 strong, a good even number. With our bigger squad, I investigated the floodland ruins for any treasures. You know me, I just gotta scratch that loot goblin itch. I did get my <laughs> pushed in when I tried to investigate in ancient labs. Those robot spiders are nimble and tough. They could have wiped out my squad entirely. Fortunately, that didn't happen. Soon after, we head to Burns Tower to heal up my Skelebros. Then the Flotsam Village for my fleshy duders and do that. As I was resting, I wanted to try something. I went back to World's End to see if I could give one of the ancient knowledge tomes that I found to Flinch or IO at the Science HQ. Nothing changed, so I just gave up and sold the stuff I found to the shops in town. Then I gave my squad a full recovery at the bar. After a refreshing rest, I look at our funds and decide it was time to visit a special shop for the best gear. There's a river that connects the floodlands to Okran's pride. In between, there's a ruined shop that's still operational. It's the Armor King, or as the Britbongers say, the Armorer. Anyways, he sells high to master quality armors, so it's definitely worth the trip to upgrade our current loadout. After being dripped out, I felt like a redo of the ancient labs was in order. This time, I was gonna finesse it. I would use someone to lure out the robot spiders and have Beep shoot them. There were still injuries suffered, but no fatalities. And we cleared out the lab of enemies. The place was a treasure trove for parts, technology, and other expensive looking stuff. We did have to rest here though. I didn't want to travel around with our injuries slowing us down. Moving on from the floodlands, the heroes traveled around the foglands along the coast to move south. I didn't want to have to go through the fog islands nor the holy nation lands. We would just end up getting eaten or enslaved going through those areas. We did have to go through obedience. The area is dangerous due to hostile skeletons and robo spiders, but we lucked out and didn't encounter any. I did discover the shrieking forest in my hundreds of playtime of Kenshi. I don't think I've explored this area as much. It was quite beautiful. However, I did encounter groups of naked screaming bandits. They didn't bother me, so I continued on with my scenic route. I even sold my loot to the passing hive towns. It was a peaceful adventure all the way until I was almost into a city. I got chased by dust bandits into Squin. The gate guards handled them easily, so I wasn't worried. I even took the bandits gear to sell in the shops for my troubles. Afterwards, I started heading east into the swamp. I proceeded into Shark so I could talk to the leader of the hounds, the faction and power of the biggest city in the swamp. I couldn't talk to Big Grim herself. Why? Well, I remembered you need to pay to get an audience with her. In one of the bars, you have to talk to Ears and pay him a 2000 cat fee. Then you can finally talk to Big Grim. In order for us to ally with them, we need to sell hashish in the United Cities. I'm actually five head. And already know how to sell hashish. So I was totally up for it. But you could just lie and just give her your own money, pretending you sold the hashish. But where's the fun in that? First, I took our fastest runner, Zero, to handle the task. Traveling as a group is slow, and Grim wanted this done within a week. A reasonable time period, but I wanted to be quick about it. I didn't want to forget to do this later. While Zero sprinted to the United Cities, I had the rest of the group do a hashish run to Flats Lagoon. That way, the split party wouldn't be too too unproductive. During this run, Zero almost died to some big things. It would have been the end for Zero, but there was a bar just out in the middle of nowhere. I think it was in Shem? Whatever. It was a saving grace as the patron saved Zero when he hid inside the building. Meanwhile, the rest of the squad killed a big thing in the way, and they made it to Flats Lagoon to make their sale. Back to Zero, he made it to Henge and sold the hash to the Shinobi Fence. You can't sell hashish directly to the shops, you'll just get reported and the guards will beat you up. Finally, I had the main squad back at Shark. Big Grim was happy to get her cut and I was now allied with the hounds. Zero was up in the cannibal plains. I wanted to train his stealth and thievery skill, so why not practice with some cannibal encampments? Stupidly dangerous, but the mad lad ran in hot. Cannibals were on his tail and I just had him storm into the storehouse and just stole things to train his thievery. I got him up to level 34. Decent. Next, I had everyone regroup in the hub just to have anyone with past injuries heal up while the rest train with the stuff in the tower during the downtime. Rested and recovered, it was time to head on out. I went to Flats Lagoon to hire some extra bodyguards. It was time for us to get another squad mate while taking out a problematic bandit leader, a two for one special. But we would have to travel into a dangerous region. 
Venge. It had patrolling skeleton thralls and beak things. And the environmental hazard too. A giant <laughs> laser shot from the sky. We ventured to find an old tower. Inside were skeleton thralls and their masters. It was a big battle and we got knocked pretty bad. Luckily no one died. We just had to be like Rocky. Take the punch and get back up to fight again. It was slow but we managed to lure out both leaders. They had the highest tier of weapons. Mitao? Mitao? Meow? Don't tell me it's meow in the game where they call money cats. I'm just going to call it Mitiao. Mitiao, yeah, Mitiao. Crafted from a legendary smith. Anyways, we took their gear and had Sad Neil and Burn split off to turn in the bounties in the United Cities. Inside the lab was a prisoner, a different model of skeleton. He was just as tough, but he had a racial bonus that included range combat, which I found interesting. However, he's a unique character in that he cannot speak, meaning that he can't interact with NPCs. Fair enough. We recruited Agnew. He did scream a lot though. I found it funny. Anyways, we rested and looted the place of its valuable technology inside while we waited for Sad Neil and Burn to turn in the bounties. Once regrouped, we headed to Flats Lagoon. Anything we didn't need, we sold and bought equipment for Agnew. Next, it was time for us to make some new allies, the anti-slavers. They're based in Stobes Gamble, close by too. The reason why I held off on doing it until now was because once you do, the United Cities will know you're an anti-slaver. Slaver, so you'll have less options in their territory to rest and resupply. With that explained, I talked with the anti-slaver leader, Tinfist, then to his second in command, Gray. He led us into the folds and we were now allied with the anti-slavers. To progress further in my plan, I would have to go east. I avoided going east of Flats Lagoon because the enemies there were more dangerous. Skeleton bandits, flesh bandits, reavers, and not to mention the crags is a maze of hills. While I did just list off those dangers, we only got attacked by some scavengers trying to score some loot. We absolutely destroyed them with our better gear and skill. Some skeleton bandits did show up as we left. Best time to GTFO. In Stobes Garden, we did encounter a lone reaver. Not dangerous, so we took him out easily. The patrols are dangerous though. If they incapacitate your party, they will enslave your party and conscript you into being a slave soldier. That just gives me the ick. Finally, when we arrived at the pits east, Crabtown is where the crab crab queen sits. Contrary to the name, she's a Scorchlander and not an actual crab. I decided to purchase a crab pet from one of the settlements and I named him Crabulon. He was small now, but in time he will grow big and strong. Anyways, I snuck past most of my enemies to get to crab town and spoke to the crab queen. We talked about how we both love crabs, <laughs> and not the STD, and joined up with them. They also sell one of the most best defense armor in game. I would have purchased some, but I decided against it. The drawbacks were too much in my my opinion. Overall, getting their friendship was rather easy, so I thought I'd follow up with something more difficult, the rebel farmers. I'd have to travel through the United Cities and into the Sinkun region, and talk with Boss Simeon about working together with the anti-slavers. Oh, that was actually easy too. Okay, I guess I overestimated the mission. So what's next? The Shek Kingdom. Hmm, to ally with them we have to deliver the Lord Phoenix or Bugmaster. Oof, yikes. Okay, this will be difficult. Lord Phoenix is not next on the plan yet, so it will have to be Bugmaster. The pain is going to be getting to him. He's based in the spider planes. There's big nests of spider patrols around, so it won't be easy. And I'm not actually joking. But first things first, getting there. We're all the way on the top of the map, and Bugmaster is in the southeast corner. So we'll head for the hub, resupply and rest to refresh ourselves. We were refreshed and ready. We embarked from the hub towards southeast. It was rather smooth sailing getting to the spider planes. The only real problem came when we arrived. The patrols of skin crawlers were massive. Every fight weakened us before we could even reach our destination. Once we arrived at the tower, we had a final wave of insects just come out. It was a team effort just to keep everyone alive and prevent any spiders from eating the unconscious. We just had to take a break and rest underneath the boss himself. He would be another layer of difficulty, considering his stats were in the high 90s. Once everyone was ready, we had all the melee members charge while the crossbow men stood behind and shot from a safe distance. Our numbers and equipment totally overwhelmed the bug master.
down for the count. We scooped him up, made like a banana, and split. When we arrived at Andemag, the shack guards were impressed. Once we gave the Bugmaster over to Bayan, Aseda the Stone Goblin wanted an audience. She pronounced us an invincible. There was a cheer, and we were now allies with the Shack Kingdom. Also, Aseda gave her daughter, Seto, to join the heroes. The final member of our group, Eleven Strong. And that completed our ally list. It was time to move on to phase two of the plan, taking out the major factions. First up, we need to go south to the Royal Valley. We're going to take out the Queen of the Southern Hive. We stopped by in Flats Lagoon to hire the same muscle that helped us in rescuing Agnew. In the Royal Valley, the Hive patrols were actually pretty tough. We held against them, but the deeper we got, our squad couldn't handle it. We got knocked out easily. We had to abandon the quest and try a new tactic than just charging in with full force. Piece by piece, the squad would escape the Royal Valley to the closest sediment they could find to rest. That's when I had an idea. We could just set up our own outpost nearby. That way we didn't have to travel long distances to rest and recuperate. First, I would need to research, so I headed to the hub to buy some property, fix it up, and begin researching stuff we would need. It was a lengthy process. I split the group to have one team research, while the second team searched for materials and artifacts at shops. It took us days to research find supplies, and travel to a suitable location. By day 64, we had a functional outpost in the southern coast of the map. Now, it was time to get distracted. I got Agnew to attack a Leviathan. He quickly ran out of ammunition with his crossbow, so I had Hamut resupply him and bring extra firepower. The reason why I was doing this? Well, I thought you could do the attack exploit like we did earlier in Black Desert City with the robot spiders, but replace them with one of the strongest creatures in the game. Turns out, you can't pick them up. Too bad. It would have been hilarious to see them being trained on. The pearl was nice at least. Okay, back on track. I sent Zero to try and kidnap the queen. If we couldn't attack them openly, we would have to be sneaky about it. Welp, Zero didn't have a high enough assassination skill. So I thought maybe we could try having Beep snipe the queen with his trusty crossbow. I couldn't get a clean shot no matter how close I placed him. And we were running out of time. So I couldn't train them in time. Or can I? With the time flying by, it was time to do something dangerous. We were going to the Ashlands and visit the Mad King. Now, he's not on the list, but he can help us train our skill we'll need for the Queen. I had Beep and Zira go for a mad dash to the Ashlands. The both of them snuck into Catlon's throne room and hid behind the throne. If you didn't know, you can train your assassination skill on Catlon. All you have to do is quick save and quick load right as he gives his speech. This will glue him to his chair and he won't attack you. Also, if you don't want to actually KO him, take off an arm. Then it was just a matter of spam clicking, all the way up to 90. Satisfied, I actually had him knocked out and I took his legendary weapon. Then we made our escape, but they both made it back to base safely. I had zero rest while it was time for Beep to carry out the mission. With the cover of night, I had Beep sneak into the Southern Hive Palace and kidnap the queen. It was a huge success. I was unsure how to actually execute the queen now that we had her in custody, so I just had everyone just fight her at the outpost. She got domed by, I think, Agnew, instantly killing her. Now the Southern Hive was with no leader. That's the first First item crossed off our list. Given that we were lucky in killing our target without them escaping, I thought it would be appropriate to get a device to expedite and ensure the kill. That's why I had Beep infiltrate the Skin Bandit HQ and steal a blueprint for the Peeler Machine. Given its name and its origin, I'll let you guys guess in the comments below. Funniest wrong answer wins. Anyways, I had a couple built at base, tested out, and I had Beep go to the Black Desert City to buy some prosthetics for no particular reason. Wink wink nudge nudge. With that mess sorted, it was time to go to Storb's Garden for a visit to Valamon, the leader of the Reavers. Their base was massive, so once I got in, I just headed straight for Valamon on his throne, knocked him out, and was chased out by the whole faction. With Valamon secured, we headed back to base. On our way back, we discovered a pool of acid, so I just dumped Valamon into the corrosive liquid. We watched until he was melted and dead. Another one crossed off the hit list. No more slave soldiers or Reavers anymore. Zero 
Zero and Beeper on a roll, so I just continued down the list. Next up, Big Al of the Stone Rats. So we traveled to the swamp. The Stone Rats didn't even know we were coming. We just broke into the compound and just took Big Al while everyone was still up. For Big Al, Beep put a couple shots into him. Nothing instantly killed him, so we carried him around until he bled out. Slow, but he got the job done. Next up would be Shade of the Swamp Ninjas. They were nearby. They're based in the southern wetlands, so it wasn't a far trip for Zero and Beep. Beep waltzed in and kidnapped Shade. Originally, I was going to turn her in for the bounty with Beep while Zero was going to sell her gear. However, she just disappeared from Beep's grasp. She did have some wounds untended to, so I assumed she bled out and despawned when I checked in with Beep. Unfortunate. I think that's another enemy down. Off the list she goes. The final leader in the swamp we need to take out was the Red Saber boss. Zero was already there, so I had him sneak into the building at night, take the boss when he was sleeping, and no one even noticed Zero. And if they did, no one attacked him. Easy peasy. The boss did succumb to his wounds during the trip to the Shek Kingdom though. So we put his corpse on a pole for the cats. It was a win-win. Now the hounds could take over the hideouts. Duders and dudettes, we were on a roll. But still, we only had 20 days left and the hit list wasn't even half done. It was time for Beep and Zero to hurry things up. We sprinted to New Kralia and snatched Flying Bull in the broad daylight and dumped him in acid water. He melted and that was another name crossed off our list. For our next three, we would need to travel to the Holy Lands. We traveled to the military base Oak Grand Shield. This place was heavily guarded and fortified, but nothing our stealthy ninjas couldn't handle. We looked for High Inquisitor Valtina. Eventually, we found him in the barracks. With a simple knockout, we got him and were chased out by the paladins. It was a high-risk operation, but we got him. Instead of letting him bleed out, we head for our old home in the hub and we built a peeler machine and he would be our first death on the machine. Next on the list, High Inquisitor Seta. He's actually in the nearby city of Stack. Another snatch and grab job with all the guards on our tail, but we were too fast for those clunky plated zealots. <laughs> And just like Valtenna, High Inquisitor Seda was peeled to death. The final leader of the Holy Nationalists would be Lord Phoenix over at Blister Hill. When Zero and Beep arrived just outside the city walls, it was still dark out, the perfect time to sneak in. I just had Zero kidnap Phoenix while he slept and snuck out of there, until a gate guard saw him, so they both picked up the pace back to the hub. Just like the other two supremacists, Phoenix was peeled away until he's dead, thus marking the beginning of the end for the Holy Racists. Now the Shek Kingdom and the Flotsam Ninjas can take over their old cities. Now it's time to take on the United Cities of Slavery. First, we would need a small outpost to carry out the peeling operation since they were so effective. I did so by picking up some property in the way station. I also had the rest of the party rendezvous at the way station, just in case I needed backup or extra supplies. While they ventured from the south to the way station, I had Zero and Beep infiltrate Heft to capture Emperor Tengu while he was asleep. The duder was probably in a food coma from all the green food he's been munching on. Then we quickly made it back to the way station to construct a peeler and used it to peel away all that fat from that greedy pig. Next up, the head of the Traders Guild, Long Jen. He was in Traders Edge, just standing idle. It was an easy grab, but we did have to dodge all those samurais and slaver guards. Just like Tengu, the slaver scum was peeled. With the two major leaders of the United Cities dead, the cities were struggling to stay in control. However, there were still holdouts, the last heads of the Hydra to slice off. There's so many lords and slave masters to go through and not many days left so I'll just list them off. Slave Master Grande of Eye Socket, Slave Mistress Ren of Slave Farm, Slave Master Rubin of Southstone Camp, Slave Master Wada of Port South, Slave Master Hanga of Stone Camp, Lord Nagata of Shobatai, Lord Inaba of Stoat, Lady Sanda of Bark, Lady Kana of Port North, Lady Tusigi of Brink, Slave Market Master of the Slave Markets, Lady Mirin of Drifter's Last, Finally, Slave Master Grace of Slave Farm South. The United Cities were now gone. The rebel farmers and anti-slavers have taken over. The peasants were now in power, ending the suffering and slavery. We did it! Part 2 of the plan! Now it's time to move on to the third, but optional part of the plan. The cleanup. We just need to take care of the gorilla bandits, the skeleton bandits, the flesh bandits, and the berserkers. We started 
started with the Flesh Bandits and kidnapped their leader Savant. Since we already visited him before but didn't finish the job, he met his end on his own creations and was peeled to death. Ironic. For the Gorilla Bandits, I tried having Zero just attack him outright. It failed, but the leader himself carried Zero out. His mistake, since a random beak thing came out and attacked, Zero just took advantage of the situation and took the defeated Gorilla. Then he met his end in the machine. While that was happening, Beep traveled north to the ruined village and took Ghost, the leader of the Berserkers. His leadership would end in the hub. And Zero finished the job by going over to the crags and visiting the skeleton bandit leader, Elder. It was an easy kill since all he had to do was rip out Elder's AI core. We did it! With 5 days to spare, I used the remaining time to regroup everyone at the southern outpost. But when everyone arrived on day 99, there was a large assault on the base from the survivors of the samurais. The party was knocked, but our allies from the rebel farmers and the Shek kingdom came to our aid. The samurais were defeated and we survived all the way to day 100. Thanks to everyone that watched the video, give it a like if you enjoyed, comment below your thoughts on the series, and subscribe for future content. Also I have a discord server linked in the description, come join us. Again, thanks for everyone watching, and see you duders and dudettes later.